and uh, lots going on right now. And I just wanted to mention before we start a couple of interesting things. As everyone's probably aware, um, there are now some new uh, blood-related markers instead of CSF, um, phosphotau-181, uh, which is uh, uh, Alzheimer's-specific. Uh, should not be there in you know other uh, tauopathies typically. Uh, and um, it has been uh, suggested to be a fairly sensitive marker. It doesn't seem to be as early of a change as phosphotau-217, which is just coming up. But I think these two are going to be incredibly useful uh, for seeing people who have uh, who have Alzheimer's. They may they may you know mostly replace PET scans over time. And the great thing about them is you can actually follow them over time. And there's a suggestion that you may be able to see improvement uh, three to six months out. We'll see. Uh, these will be used in the upcoming trial that that Anne and Kat and others are involved uh, with. Um, then also there is GFAP, which is glial fibrillary acidic protein. The negative on that one is it's relatively nonspecific for brain damage, so it tells you something different. The positive is it's a very early change uh, that you see with degenerative diseases. And then there's another one, uh, NFL, neurofilament light. That one, it was initially used for things like ALS, uh, but it is turning out to be uh, increased in brain-related diseases as well. So these may be helpful. One of the interesting new insights that's coming to some extent from uh, interactomics discussions with Dr. Alexei Karakin, who's one of my colleagues we've published together over the years, that when you look at the interactome, for APP and look at the, the nature of this disease, it's really coming out that this is a chronic encephalitis. We should be thinking about this, uh, you know, Alzheimer's is just a name. It doesn't tell you anything about the disease. The claim over the years is it's a disease of protein aggregation and protein misfolding and all these kind of silly concepts um, that really haven't proven uh, out, especially with the anti-amyloid antibodies where people don't get better. They may in the best case scenario, just slightly slow their decline. And you may have seen solanezumab, uh, yet another failure uh, recently. And they even started in people who had who had either no symptoms or just minimal symptoms, and they still didn't have any benefit. In fact, the control group did slightly better than the treatment group. So uh, I think that the interesting thing is, if we think about this as a chronic innate encephalitis. It's really mostly the innate immune system and especially innate memory. Then it tells us a few things uh, when we translate this. So what does that mean for what we do for our patients? Well, number one, it means that we should really be jumping on things that decrease microglial activation, things like resolvents that probably everybody, even with their low HSCRP, should be thinking about something like that. Secondly, the innate memory is in three sites, in bone marrow, in endothelial cells, and in tissue macrophages. So therefore, um, you should probably think about things like pycnogenol or natokinase if there isn't a concern about bleeding, if there isn't a concern with congophilic angiopathy, if you don't have microbleeds on the MRI. Or low platelets. What's that? Or low platelets. Or, yeah, yeah, our low platelets. Look yeah, for the thank obvious you. things, yeah. Yeah, good good point, yeah. And the other thing, to be fair, um, fam we've seen people with family histories of cerebral hemorrhage who turn out to have congophilic angiopathy, you know, uh, one after the other person and, and typically get these low bar hemorrhages, very different than the hypertensive hemorrhages, which are deep, typically putaminal, uh, or sometimes cerebellar or brainstem but very different than the low bar hemorrhages that you get with, uh, with congophilic angiopathy. Um, and then the next thing is um, mast cells can be involved and everyone's seen people who have uh, MCAS or MCAD, depending on what you like to call it. Uh, and um, interesting, we had a very interesting person recently, big response to a single dose of Nurtec. Um, so, you know, CGRP is one of the things that mast cells produce. Uh, and that particular pathway may turn out to be more important than we thought it was. So if there's any suggestion of this whatsoever, great idea. And Dr. Craig Tanio actually mentioned that he tries Ubrelvi sometimes. Um, the person recently who responded, responded to Nurtec, and then two days later needed it again and responded again. So it's, it's an interesting anecdotal report, but certainly kind of just reminds us 
uh, not to forget about the importance, uh, potential importance of mast cells in cognition. Uh, and then, of course, um, LDN is another one. So these are sorts of things that we may have been underutilizing overall, though I know uh, Dr. Hathaway uses these frequently. So often we're you know, waiting for the genetics to tell us this, but it may turn out that in the pathophysiology, and this isn't to take away from the genetics, which are absolutely critical, but sometimes the pathophysiology is telling us, here's the nature of this disease. What it's boiling down to is that your probability of Alzheimer's can now kind of be collapsed. I used to use a, a, an integral for four different groups, but it's really collapsing down to IA over E, in, uh, immune activation divided by energetics. So we wanna drop that immune activation, find out what's causing it and address that. And we wanna bring that energy up. So again, things like EWOT uh, turning out to be really, really important.